we are going to be doing a let's read of the original 1974 edition of Dungeons and Dragons by Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax. Uh, next up we have the spell tables. We have one for magic users, obviously based on the levels of the spells, and we also have one for clerics. But as we take a look at the spell tables, one of the interesting things about the spell tables is that they're numbered down the left-hand side, which means that you can randomly determine spells very easily by just rolling an appropriate die. Over here on the clerics table, same thing here. Like exactly how spell casting works is left a little bit vague in this edition, with some information kind of spread around. We'll kind of come across that as we go ahead here. Obviously the wizards back then had more spell levels than clerics. Uh, wizards had six levels of spells and clerics only had five. Down at the bottom of this page we can see the turning undead table, clerics versus undead monsters that we've mentioned a few times. They do get that ability uh, basically from first level here, from acolyte right here. Numbers are the score to match or exceed in order to turn away, rolled with two six-sided dice. T means turned away, up to two dice in number. D is dispelled or dissolved, up to two dice in number and N is no effect. So you do have some turn abilities at low levels, but against certain undead, you just have no chance. So there's kind of a penumbra of sevens and nines on the table here where you might succeed, and then higher levels where you automatically succeed if you are a sufficiently high level uh, cleric. The game then says a full explanation of each spell follows. Note that underlined clerical spells are reversed by evil clerics. Also note that clerics versus undead monsters table indicating the strong effect of the various clerical levels upon the undead. However, Evil clerics do not have this effect, the entire effect being lost. So if you chose to be on Team Evil, you would not be able to turn undead. And the concept of, of uh, rebuking undead or controlling undead as the reverse of that had not yet been innovated and created. One whole class feature disappears if you choose to be evil in od and &D. Quite a few of the cleric spells can be reversed. We can see Cure Light Wounds, Purify Food and Water, Detect Evil, Protection from Evil, Light, Cure Disease, Continual Light, Bless, Cure Serious, Protection from Evil, 10-foot Radius, Dispel Evil, Raise Dead. That's a lot of spells that can be reversed by evil clerics. So evil clerics and good clerics would have very different flavors to them in this edition of the game. And here we hit the explanation of the spells. Gygax appeared to be really convinced that explanation was spelled explanation. It occurs that way as far as I can tell in every instance in the first printing of the books before being uh, errated and corrected in future printings. The spells are organized first by character class. We can see we have the magic users here, and then second by level, and then third alphabetically within the level. Actually, that's not even true in this edition. Excuse me. The spells are not alphabetical. They are just tossed in there willy-nilly, however you will. This organizational method by class and then by spell level and then the individual spells would persist all the way up through second edition. But I think it was just kind of a decision that was made probably because that's the kind of the way in which they made sense to be organized from a certain point of view. But there are disadvantages to organizing the spells like this, and the primary one is that if you come across a spell name in a monster stat block, for example, or a module's description of a particular trap, and you don't know what level that spell is, or even necessarily what class can cast that spell, it can be incredibly difficult to find a spell when they're organized in this fashion. This was actually changed in third edition for, as far as I know, the first time. The the spell lists still existed. The, the spell list, of course, being we're looking at before, where the spell list would list, obviously, spells by class and by level. But the actual spell section describing all the spells, that was alphabetical, which made it relatively easy to find every spell you needed in the moment of, of running the game. And this is kind of one of those interesting tensions within a role-playing rulebook in particular, where the rulebook really has to be designed to be used for three different purposes. One of those purposes is character creation. Another purpose is learning the rules. And then the third purpose is actually referencing and using the rules at the table during play. And balancing the way in which you organize the information within the rulebook to satisfy all of those needs, uh, it's not always possible to satisfy all of them at once. And this is a good example of that, which is why I think actually the later method of having the spell lists be organized in such a way that you can very clearly see what your options are for a given level, but then having the actual spell section in a purely alphabetical format for all the spells is, in my opinion, a superior way to do it because it seems to be a better balance between those different needs of how you need to use a rulebook. Magic users. 
first level. So our first spell in the book is Detect Magic, a spell to determine if there has been some enchantment laid on a person, place, or thing. It has a limited range and short duration. It is useful, for example, to discover if some item is magical, a door has been held or wizard locked, etc. The sentence, it has a limited range and short duration. If you were looking at that same sentence in a, let's call it a modern edition of the game, those terms, limited range and short duration, would almost certainly be terms of art that would be defined somewhere else. A, a short duration would be five minutes, for example, or whatever the game chose to define that as, and a limited range would have some definition of what limited meant. But neither one of those actually has a definition in OD&D, and so that really is up to the DM's interpretation of, well, what is a limited range, and how short is the duration? Is it a few minutes? Is it a dungeon turn? Is it an hour? Like, what constitutes uh, short? I also thought it might be interesting to occasionally dip into 5th edition, the current edition of the game, and take a peek at like what the current version of the spell is. So we have our Detect Magic from OD&D, fast forward by 40 years to 2014, and we enter into the 5th edition Player's Handbook, where we see now we have this Detect Magic spell, which is a first level divination ritual. And right away we can see how magic has evolved over time. First off, of course, there's these all these ritual rules, which are an innovation of really 5th edition. Edition. And then you have divination. There's actually schools of magic. And one thing you don't have in uh, OD&D is, is separate schools of magic. If you look back, you can very easily see why that probably wasn't necessary yet, because there just weren't that many spells. If you tried to divide these spells up across multiple schools of magic, you wouldn't have enough to, to fill them. Only when you begin getting a plethora of spells do you need to invent additional ways of organizing those spells. But if we go back to 5th edition here, we have a casting time of one action. So there's also here an interesting thing about actually really defining how long it takes to cast a spell and having different casting times for spells that were kind of obviously standardized, but even really extant. As we've seen so far looking through the rule book, and I'm pretty sure this holds true throughout the original trilogy in, in the white box, there isn't really any rules telling you how, how long does it take to cast a spell. There are a few exceptions that we'll be getting into, but in terms of like general rules or general guidance, it isn't really there. And so you kind of have to make, again, a judgment call. Can you cast detect magic in combat, for example, or does it take longer than that. We have a range of self that gets into like what I was just talking about in terms of now having defined ranges for the spell. In this case, the range is defined by who, what is affected by the spell. In this case, they have clearly defined that as you are the one being affected by the magic and its effect is to allow you to see magic. We have spell components, again, something that did not exist in OD&D. We have a duration that is now defined, uh, concentration up to 10 minutes, replacing the previous short duration. We also have the description of the spell. For the duration, you sense the presence of magic within 30 feet of you. We again see that definition of a specific, putting things in specific numbers as opposed to a broad category. If you sense magic in this way, you can use your action to see a faint aura around any visible creature or object in the area that bears magic, and you learn its school of magic, if any. The spell can penetrate most barriers, but it is blocked by one foot of stone, one inch of common metal, a thin sheet of lead, or three feet of wood or dirt. This spell has not changed a whole lot in its description. There are versions of the game where the the final paragraph there has been expanded to include other guidelines for use. But one thing to note is I'm pretty sure this guideline goes all the way back to basically a D&D more or less in its current form. And that's something you really, if you look at these spells over time and how they developed from OD&D up until today, one of the big things you'll really notice in the game is that they have uh, most spells have accumulated what I will describe as official rulings. There are questions that lots of people have that come up often during play, and in general the designers have attempted to address those issues by tacking on additional guidance into the book. And in this case, the question of can I detect magic through a wall, for example, or inside a treasure chest, is something that obviously a lot of players were interested to know the answer to, and so the game has attempted to standardize that answer. We reverse the time machine and head back to 1974, and we move on to Hold Portal, a spell to hold a door, gate, or the like. It is similar to a locking spell, see below, but it is not permanent. Roll two dice to determine the duration of the spell in turns. Dispel magic, see below, will immediately negate it. A strong anti-magical creature will shatter it, for example, the Balrog in the Ring trilogy, and a knock, see below, 
will open it. So this is an example, obviously, of the open references to J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth. And if we go to the sixth printing here and look at the same material for this for this particular spell, we can see that the reference to Tolkien's ring material has been removed. It's not there anymore. And you can kind of see the garish hole, which is left behind by, by that, where this is basically, they just cut it out and there's a big white gap because they had no text to fill that gap with. But that's an example of the kind of errata that is found low level kind of throughout the entire book because these token references were kind of scattered all over and they all had to be pulled back out after the lawsuit. A lot of these spells have a, a, a real clear function within a dungeon style campaign. The next spell here is read magic. The means by which the incantations on, or incantions, I guess is the way they've chosen to spell that. I kind of like the sound of that, incantion. The incantions on an item or scroll are read. Without such a spell or similar device, magic is unintelligible to even a magic user. The spell is of short duration, one or two reading being the usual limit. So I always think that's a really interesting feature of the older editions of the game. The idea that magical writing is not something that wizards or other spellcasters can automatically interpret. They need to have this specific spell prepared to allow them to do so. Here we have the spells of short duration, one or two readings being the usual limit. So short duration, again, is kind of an open-ended, undefined term. But in this case, it has been nailed down with a slightly more precise definition for the purpose of this specific spell. Read languages, the means by which directions and the like are read, particularly on treasure maps. It is otherwise like the read magic spell above. And that largely is explanatory. Although it is interesting to note, much like Hold Portal has an obvious use within a dungeon context of holding doors, that the, the use of treasure maps here is specifically called out. As we'll see in the Underworld and Wilderness book later on in OD&D, treasure maps were actually a a much more core function of gameplay that could actually emerge through procedural content generators in OD&D. &D. And so we're just kind of an expected form of play in a way that I don't feel they actually are that much anymore. Like you, you only rarely see treasure maps these days. Back in the day, they were kind of everywhere. And that sort of assumed form of play is kind of an interesting one. This is a bit of a tangent. But you can also see that in the fact that there were actually multiple third-party publishers who published books that were just collections of treasure maps that the game master could give out if the rule said, oh, hey, you found a treasure map in this treasure pile or in this in this dungeon seed. And being able to have sort of a resource of treasure maps to go to when the game said, hey, you need to provide one was seen as a valuable resource. Protection from evil. This spell hedges the conjurer around with a magic circle to keep out attacks from enchanted monsters. It also serves as an armor from various evil attacks, adding a plus one to all saving throws and taking a negative one from hit dice of evil opponents. Note that this spell is not cumulative in effect with magic armor and rings, although it will continue to keep out enchanted monsters. Duration, six turns. This is an example of a spell that over time has accumulated more and more specific rulings. In fact, if we pop back over to fifth edition, we have the protection from evil and good spell now. And the new spell here in fifth edition says, until the spell ends, one willing creature you touch is protected against certain types of creatures, aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. The protection grants several benefits. Creatures of those types have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target. The target also can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. If the target is already charmed, frightened, or possessed by such a creature, the target has advantage on any new saving throw against the relevant effect. And this is actually a significant simplification of where the spell had grown over the course of AD&D &D and into third edition, where there was a, a host of basically the type of rulings we've talked about trying to nail down exactly what the limits of a protection spell were. The other notable thing about the protection spell, as you can see in OD&D, &D, is that it was limited to a magic circle, which meant that the conjurer was not able to move outside of that circle, and the spell could only really affect themselves. Light. A spell to cast light in a circle three inches in diameter, not equal to full daylight. It lasts for a number of turns equal to six plus the number of levels of the user, and thus a seventh level magic user would cast the spell for 13 turns. We see here the three inches, and the reason for that is the war game legacy of Dungeons and Dragons. War games generally measure their movement in inches on the table where the scale map was drawn out, and this is a legacy of that that the people run 
running and playing these games with thinking in these terms, even if they weren't using miniatures, which the book talked about earlier, the fact that you can use miniatures, but they're not really used for battle. They're just kind of very pretty. They are still thinking in terms of that kind of number. And this inch legacy will stick around for a very surprisingly long time in D&D before being phased out in favor of game world measurements and then being replaced briefly once again by war game measurements in the form of squares before being phased out once again in 5th edition. Charm Person. This spell applies to all two-legged, generally mammalian figures near to or less than man size, excluding all monsters in the undead class, but including sprites, pixies, nixies, kobolds, goblins, orcs, hobgoblins, and gnolls. If the spell is successful, it will cause the charmed entity to come completely completely under the influence of the magic user until such time as the charm is dispelled, dispel magic, range of 12 inches. So here we see an actual specific defined range for the spell. Most likely that's because the spell is targeting a creature and so it is seen as an attack and attacks need a specific range within the war game mindset, whereas detect magic is not targeting specific creatures. It's not an attack spell. And so we can afford to be a little bit more wishy-washy. We don't need that level of precision from the mechanics, is the perception I would read from the text here. The other thing to know about Charm Person here, that it's, this is one of those examples of things that if you are coming to the original edition of D&D with the benefits and experience of later editions of play, that you may not immediately notice, but Charm Person is incredibly powerful in first edition D&D. It's actually much closer to the spell that would eventually become known as Dominate Person, because the phrasing of it will cause the charmed entity to come completely under the influence of the magic user doesn't leave a whole lot of wiggle room. Now, if you follow this discourse moving forward into like the early fanzines and then TSR's Strategic Review magazine, which would later evolve into Dragon magazine and into AD&D and so forth, generally speaking, the overall trend was to immediately begin trying to blunt off the effectiveness of charm to take the completely under the influence and interpret that as you know slightly under the influence up until we'll say the modern day here where charm person remains a first level spell but its effect now is you attempt to charm a humanoid you can see within range it must make a wisdom saving throw so right there that's a key that's an interesting difference there's no specific saving throw called out here obviously if it was being cast on a pc they would make a saving throw versus spells but that's not really necessarily called out. But here, of course, we have specific types of saving throws being specifically defined, and does so with advantage if you or your companions are fighting it. If it fails the saving throw, it is charmed by you until the spell ends or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. That's your first major change, is to say you can't just charm somebody and then stab them with impunity. The charmed creature regards you as friendly acquaintance. When the spell ends, the creature knows it was charmed by you you. All the provisions and provisos that have been given to the spell over time in an effort to sort of blunt how much damage can be done with it, so to speak. What was the scale of the old school inches? They actually vary depending on whether or not you were in the dungeon or in the wilderness. In the dungeon, they generally equated to 10 feet per inch, if I recall correctly. And in the outer world, I want to say in od and it was 30 feet to the inch, three times larger, which created weird things like fireball spells, for example, were larger outside than they were inside. Sleep. A sleep spell affects from 2 to 16 first level types, hit dice of up to 1 plus 1, from 2 to 12 second level types, hit dice of up to 2 plus 1, and from 1 to 6 third or fourth level types, up to 4 plus 1 hit dice. The spell always affects up to the number of creatures determined by the dice. If more than the number rolled could be affected, determine which sleep by random selection. Range of 24 inches. So sleep is arguably the most useful first level spell in OD&D because it is designed to be an encounter ending spell. Its function makes a lot of sense in the context of the assumed mega dungeon play, particularly at low levels of original Dungeons and Dragons, where you anticipate to be going into a dungeon filled with a lot of hostile creatures. And if you ever bit off more than you can chew, particularly at these early levels, sleep is a pretty reliable spell for knocking out an encounter or certainly blunting the difficulty of that encounter quite a bit and sort of getting your bacon out of the fire. Now, sleep is a spell that had been horrifically nerfed over the course of its lifespan. 
And if we come up to 5th edition here, we can see it's still a first level spell. Its range has dropped considerably from 240 feet to 90 feet. Its duration is a minute long. There actually is no defined duration in the OD&D version of the spell. They just fall unconscious. So in 5th edition, this, this spell sends creatures into a magical slumber. Roll 5d8. The total is how many hit points of creatures this spell can affect. Creatures within 20 feet of a point you choose within range are affected in ascending order of their current hit points, ignoring unconscious creatures. Starting with the creature that has the lowest current hit points, each creature affected by the spell falls unconscious until the spell ends, the sleeper takes damage, or someone uses an action to shake or slap the sleeper awake. Subtract each creature's hit points from the total before moving on to the creature with the next lowest hit points. A creature's hit points must be equal to or less than the remaining total for that creature to be affected. Undead and creatures immune to being charmed aren't affected by this spell. The other cool thing about 5th edition sleep is that if you cast it using a higher spell slot, you can actually increase the number of hit points of bad guys that are affected. And this is actually a significant improvement. Sleep had been, like I said, severely nerfed over the course of AD&D 2nd edition and into 3rd and 4th edition to the point where you could almost barely manage to get one person to fall asleep with it, which really completely nerfed the, the intended utility of the spell, which like I say, it was designed to be an encounter ending spell. And it's not quite an encounter ending spell in my experience in 5th edition, but it's a lot closer to that and it will certainly have the effect of if you're in an encounter where you're over your head or dice will have gone against against you, or you shouldn't have picked this fight to begin with, sleep can really help you in those encounters to get things back under control a bit. But the question is, why was why was sleep so severely nerfed, particularly in third and fourth edition? Well, I think part of it is, is a change in focus in terms of how particularly adventures are designed. As we'll see as we get into the adventure component and the campaign component of OD&D, there was a much more of a, a strategic sense of what an adventure was like and where the challenge lay. That the game was about a large strategic challenge. You mounted an expedition into the dungeon and your strategic challenge was to A, stay alive for the length of that expedition and also B, to maximize the rewards you could gain from running that expedition. Sleep within that context as an encounter ender were just fine because how you chose to deal with encounters you met inside the dungeon was a strategic choice. If you took out one of the encounters you had by using a sleep spell on it, you wouldn't have the spell for a later encounter. So there was a strategic choice to be made and it was an interesting choice within the context of how both the players and the dungeon master thought about those adventures and designed those adventures. What really changed over time is that the game's focus has shifted from that kind of strategic play to a more tactical focus, where instead of perceiving the entire expedition as a collective challenge that runs from the beginning to the end of a session, we instead view a dungeon adventure as a sequence of individual tactical challenges individual combats, which are often intricately designed. This was particularly true in 4th edition, where the encounters were very specifically designed, down to the specific locations of monsters at the beginning of combat, and sometimes with carefully scripted tactical scripts that the monsters were supposed to follow. And if you've spent all that time designing a three-page long encounter where the orcs are precisely placed and there's programmed events and there's all kinds of cool props and the like, then the player is walking into an encounter like that and casting a Sleep spell and having it immediately end is seen as undesirable. You've wasted a lot of prep, prepping all of this specific content for this one particular fight, and the players have gotten rid of it. It also seems terribly unbalanced because this encounter was supposed to challenge the players and they got rid of it with one spell. That shift from strategic to tactical really changes the perceived value of the sleep spell and how it impacts the desired form of play. And so as you move towards that tactical base, you really can't have spells hanging around that are encounter enders. But the tack on effect of that then feeds more heavily into the tactical side of things as well, because once the PCs no longer have spells that can get their bacon out of the fire, the problem you run into is that if they get into trouble in an encounter where they've got more goblins than they should, or if the dice are going poorly against them, the players have no ability or control to save themselves, to get out of that bad situation that they've gotten themselves into, or at least less ability to do
do so without resources like a sleep spell. And so when that happens, it now behooves the GM to make sure that the encounters that they're designing will not get out of hand, because if they get out of hand, the, the PCs will die, and a TPK, a total party kill, is generally not seen as desirable either. Once you've done that, well, now you're spending a lot of time designing the encounter to make sure that it's not too powerful for the PCs, and of course, having done that, you don't want to throw those preparations out, and so you continue nerfing the sleep spell even more. Second level. Detect Invisible Objects. A spell to find secreted treasure hidden by an invisibility spell. See below. It will also locate invisible creatures. Duration 6 turns. Range 1 inch times the level of the magic user casting it, i.e. a wizard would have a range of a 11 inches, more if he was above the base level. Wizard in this case being the, the name of an 11th level magic user. Levitate. This spell lifts the caster, all motion being in the vertical plane. However, the user could, for example, levitate to the ceiling and move horizontally by use of his hands. Duration 6 turns plus the level of the user. Range of levitation is 2 inches per level of magic user with upwards motion of 6 inches per turn. Phantasmal Forces. The creation of vivid illusions of nearly anything the user envisions, a projected mental image, so to speak. As long as the caster concentrates on the spell, the illusion will continue unless touched by some living creature, so there is no limit on duration per se. Damage caused to viewers of a phantasmal force will be real if the illusion is believed to be real. A range of 24 inches. You can create an illusion of a fireball. You can create an illusion of a dragon. You can create an illusion of an avalanche burying you in rubble and all of that will according to the spell just deal real damage over the years there's been a number of efforts to kind of rein that back in in different ways locate object in order for this spell to be effective it must be cast with certain knowledge of what is to be located thus the exact nature dimensions coloring etc of some magical item would have to be known in order for the spell to work well-known objects such as a flight of stairs leading upwards can be detected with this spell however the spell gives the user the direction of the object desired but not the distance the desired object must be within range the range is six inches plus one inch per level of the magic user employing the spell i.e a necromancer has a 16 inch range so locate objects is really interesting because we've been talking a lot about how in later editions spells like phantasmal forces and charm person for example would gain these provisors to attempt to kind of rein in how powerful the spell could or should be and here in the case of locate objects we actually see that kind of already happening like it's fairly clear to me that the reason this first sentence exists about the fact that you basically can't cast it to just find a magic item, you have to know a specific magic item in order to go looking for it, is very much something that came up during play for either Arneson or Gygax, and probably both of them. And they were like, finding magical items like that in a dungeon is too powerful, we're going to prohibit you from doing that, or limit you in a very specific way from doing that. Polyquin81, speaking about Locate Object, mentions that the thing they like about it is that it encourages the Dungeon Master to seed stories of specific items that were lost on specific dungeon levels. Great example of how the rules encourage play like that. And when you combine that with the classic old school method of having rumor tables, you can really see how those two things synergize with each other. You want to have some inkling of a specific thing down in the dungeon so that when you go looking for it, you can use resources like Locate Object to narrow your search and find these things. Invisibility, a spell which lasts until it is broken by the user or by some outside force. Remember that as in Chainmail, a character cannot remain invisible and attack. It affects only the person or thing upon whom or which it is cast, a range of 24 inches. I think the thing that makes invisibility really work in D&D &D overall is that limitation on the fact that if you attack, you will no longer be invisible. I think that makes the spell a lot easier and more palatable to handle than just perpetually invisible people running around and no one knowing where they are. Wizard Lock. Similar to a hold portal, this spell lasts indefinitely. It can be opened by a knock without breaking the spell. A wizard lock can be passed through without a spell of any kind by a magic user three levels above the one who placed the spell. You have such a limited spell list, as we look back at this, but in the first two levels of play, you already have two different spells that can be used to hold doors. And the question is, why? Well, the simple truth is, this is yet another example of a spell that could be used to help sort of control the situation if you found yourself out of your depth and need 
needed to retreat. As we'll see in later books in OD&D, OD&D, somewhat uniquely among versions of Dungeons & Dragons, has a robust and well-defined method for retreating from combat. We'll talk about that later. But one thing you can do with a wizard lock spell, for example, as we can see, is if you can manage to get a little bit of a retreat and you can cast that spell on a door, you can stop monsters from following you. And that is incredibly useful as a ability in a classic dungeon crawl. You can see the tools that are being given to players to intelligently explore dungeons. You've got spells like Locate Object that allow you to navigate in unknown areas. You can find stairs that you may not already know about. You can find other features within the dungeon. You could even potentially find some treasures as long as they were not specifically magical treasures. Like you could say, like, find me the nearest set of gold coins. And as long as you were wise enough not to have brought any gold coins, coins with you into the dungeon, you could potentially find the nearest cache of such coins. So again, it's a, it, locate object is very much a scouting spell. And on the obverse, you have things like wizard lock, which very much allow you to strategically get yourself out of sticky situations that you may find yourself into. This particular blend of abilities is very useful for that strategic level of play where you're tackling an expedition into the dungeon. Let's take a moment also to appreciate the orc artwork down there. Um, Okay, I'm done appreciating that now. Detect Evil. A spell to detect evil thought or intent in any creature or evilly enchanted object. Note that poison, for example, is neither good nor evil. Duration of two turns, range of six inches. Arneson and Gygax are both huge fans of cursed items, and Detect Evil, as we can see here, is heavily biased towards rooting out cursed objects, cursed items. The other thing, too, is, of course, you can also detect evil creatures. This is something that could also organically arise throughout the OD&D rule set, and that your hirelings and your henchmen having an evil henchman or hireling with you was dangerous and obviously detect evil would let you avoid that particular danger. ESP, a spell which allows the user to detect the thoughts, if any, of whatever lurks behind doors or in the darkness. It can penetrate solid rock up to about two inches thickness, but a thin coating of lead will prevent its penetration. Duration 12 turns, range 6 inches. Another classic spell that, again, when you're thinking about scouting the dungeon and figuring out where danger is and avoiding danger, another classic spell that gives you that kind of information. The primary thing that gets you experience points in the original edition of Dungeons & Dragons is not killing monsters. It is seeking out treasure. And so spells like this that allow you to pinpoint where the dangerous monsters you don't want to fight are allow you to strategically avoid those and go find the treasure that will both award you monetarily, obviously, but also within the XP rules of OD&D are the primary way of advancing as characters as well. Okay, next up we have Continual Light. This spell creates a light wherever the caster desires. It sheds a circle of illumination 24 inches in diameter, but does not equal full daylight. It continues to shed light until dispelled, range 12 inches. Now the interesting thing here is to look at how many of these second level spells are in fact improvements of first level spells. So you have Hold Portal that becomes Wizard Lock, you have Light that becomes Continual Light, and you also have this Knock spell, which is not an improvement over a first level spell, but it is a counter for a first level spell. First level, you have the portal spell, and second level, there is now a knock spell, which opens secret doors, held portals, doors locked by magic, barred or otherwise secured gates, etc., to a range of six inches. Now, this is purely hypothetical on my part, but I think one of the reasons you see this is because if you if you think back to the very first sessions of Castle Black War that Dave Arneson would have been running in his basement in St. Paul for his Wargamer buddies, those early characters didn't necessarily have levels yet. They had created characters, they went into the dungeon, and only over time did they develop the idea of being able to advance these characters and make them more powerful as a result of the experiences that they had gained. And so at some point in that process of innovating character advancement, you would have gotten for the first time second level spells. And my guess, again, purely hypothetical based on very little, my guess is that at the time that they created second level spells, higher level spells, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc., etc., didn't exist yet. You have your spells, and then you have like more powerful spells. And for a while, that would be the binary. Initial spells and like your level up spells or your more powerful spells, what would those be? Well, they would be, in some cases, more powerful versions of spells that you had already had it at first level at the beginning of your character. And so I think that's one of the reasons why you see that in the 
the first two levels of spells, particularly in OD&D. And later on, some of these spells like Continual Light, for example, will actually get bumped up to like third level to give a bit more space between you initially getting the spell and then getting the more powerful version. I do think it's interesting in fifth edition how they've managed to sort of conflate that back out again by kind of getting rid of a lot of the higher level versions of the spells and instead just allowing you to prep the lower levels at higher spell slots in order to unlock those more powerful abilities. I think there's a real elegance to that fifth edition solution and I'd love to see that taken actually even further in many cases with more spells having level up abilities for higher slots and some more of the legacy spells maybe being compacted into a single spell with different effects as you level it up. So the first spell for third level is fly. By means of this spell the user is able to fly at a speed of up to 12 inches per turn. The spell lasts for the number of turns equal to the level of the magic user plus the number of pips on a six-sided die which is secretly determined by the referee. Now this is a mechanic I love. It has come and gone over the years of D&D but I, I love the idea that like okay you can fly but at some point that spell is going to go away and only the dungeon master knows for sure exactly when it's going to go away and then you are going to fall out of the sky. If you wanted to make this even more potentially interesting would definitely be setting a base level and then having it modified by a 2d6 roll where you add 1d6 and then subtract 1d6. So sometimes you would have more turns and sometimes you would have fewer turns in the base level. Mathematically that's pretty much the same thing but I, I think there's psychologically something different about that. It would make players even more uncertain and have to hedge their bits a little bit more. You could get really evil if you used feng shui style dice mechanics where you did that same plus d6 minus d6 but either one of those d6s could actually explode so if you rolled a six on it, it would keep unlocking more. So sometimes your fly spells could last for hours and other times you might go up and just a few rounds in the fly spell would, would flutter away because you had a particularly poor roll on your fly duration. That's the evil part of me as a dungeon master coming out. Sure. Hold person. A spell similar to charm person but which is of both limited duration and greater effect. It will affect from one to four persons. If it is cast at only a single person it has the effect of reducing the target saving throw against magic by negative two. Uh, its duration is six turns plus level of the caster with a range of 12 inches. One of the things that jumps out to me about this text is the fact that they talk about hold person being similar to charm person. I don't think that ever happens again in the course of D&D &D. and looking at it from a modern perspective it's kind of difficult to understand why hold person would be considered similar to charm person. In this case I think it's because both of them are being interpreted as a mental effect. The hold person is not actually a physical limitation it is kind of more of a mental command to not move. So I think there's that commonality. And the other thing too is that both of them are seen as ways of basically removing people from combat through that mental persuasion if you will. A whole person is more powerful because they're not just friendly or under your under your control but they are in fact kind of removed from that combat entirely. The other interesting thing here too is you can see how kind of by the seat of the pants everything is here. Here's a spell that is similar to a charm person but it has a specific duration and a specific range and if I recall correctly charm person had a specific range but obviously no specific duration although in this case I guess the specific duration is until it's dispelled. So charm person is kind of permanent so it's kind of an interesting balance between those two spells. Okay next up we have the dispel magic spell which you've heard about several times already in the other spells. Unless countered this spell will be effective in dispelling enchantments of most kinds the referee's option except those on magical items and the like. This is modified by the following formula. The success of a dispel magic spell is a ratio of the dispeller over the original spellcaster. So if a fifth level magic user attempts to dispel the spell of a tenth level magic user there is a 50% chance of success. Duration of one turn and a range of 12 inches. You can also see as a result of that ratio calculation that if you are a higher level or an equal level to a magic user you will automatically dispel their spell. Clairvoyance is the same as ESP spell except the spell user can visualize rather than merely pick up thoughts. Clairaudience is the same as clairvoyance except it allows hearing rather than visualization. This is one of the few spells which can be cast through a crystal ball. See volume 2. So once again we see those dungeon scouting spells and once again we see how spells basically level up with you here. Improved versions of previous spells giving you new, capa new capabilities and new capacities. And in some cases creating connections that I think are obscured somewhat or, or interpreted differently in more modern editions of the game. ESP has become detect thoughts to remove that 
science fantasy psionic patina to it and i don't think most people would typically associate that except insofar as they're both divination spells now with clairvoyance and clairaudience but here you can really see the progression you can initially sort of detect the things on the other side and what they're thinking and then you can actually see them and hear them that's an interesting progression when you think about it though in terms of being able to like read people's thoughts to some extent versus being able to see them or hear them at a distance which one would you think is the more powerful or useful ability to potentially have i'd probably go with the detect thought Thoughts. but it also depends on how you interpret the detect thoughts spell and exactly what you get uh, in terms of information from that spell the next spell up is the classic fireball appearing here for the first time as two words the fireball a missile which springs from the finger of the magic user it explodes with a burst radius of two inches slightly larger than specified in chainmail in a confined space the fireball will generally conform to the shape of the space elongate or whatever the damage caused by the missile will be in proportion to the level of its user a sixth level magic user throws a six die missile a seventh a seven die missile and so on note that fireballs from scrolls see volume two and wands are six die missiles and those from staves are eight die missiles duration one turn and a range of 24 inches classic spell there and you can see the old school methodology already at play here of if you cast the fireball into a space that's too small for it it's going to expand and potentially burn you so you have to be thoughtful in how you apply this spell i think the that it tends to get overlooked with how much of an important balancing factor that was. The fireball deals an incredible amount of damage, particularly by OD&D standards, where all weapons deal 1d6 points of damage. So it deals out an incredible amount of damage to multiple targets all at once for just a third level spell. What keeps the power of that spell balanced? Well, you can't always use it effectively without annihilating your own team. And so as you get to later editions, that for the sake of simplification or kindness remove that conform to the shape of space proviso of the fireball it does to some extent unbalance the fireball this is something the designers of fifth edition talked about in terms of fireball really being a more powerful spell than a third level spell but they kept it at third level basically for legacy reasons although part of the reason they also gave was the idea that every level has one spell that's a little more powerful than it should be in order to kind of give a taste of where the wizard's going i don't know exactly how much i agree with that particular design methodology, but it's certainly an evocative and potentially intriguing one. The Lightning Bolt. Utterance of this spell generates a lightning bolt six inches long up to three and a quarter inches wide. If the space is not long enough to allow its full extension, the missile will double back to attain six inches, possibly striking its creator. It is otherwise similar to a fireball, but as stated in Chainmail, the head of the missile may never extend beyond the 24 inch range. So here again, we have a very powerful spell. Fireball gives you a burst. Lightning Bolt gives you a line. But in both cases, there is a potential risk in the enclosed spaces of a dungeon of the spell backfiring and hurting you and yours. So you have to be careful with the use of, of both of these spells. Protection from evil, 10 foot radius. A protection from evil spell which extends to include a circle around the magic user and also lasts for 12 rather than 6 turns. So this is a classic case of how the measurements in D&D are so confusing as a result of, of using those miniature scales. Because protection from evil, 10 foot radius, is immediately followed by invisibility 10 inch radius and the 10 foot radius is 10 feet and the 10 inch radius is potentially a 100 feet in a dungeon. The interesting thing about invisibility 10 inch radius in OD&D as well is it says it's an invisibility spell with an extended projection but otherwise no different from the former spell but that's a really interesting statement because if you go to the former spell it is a spell which lasts until it is broken by the user or by some outside force remember that as in chainmail a character cannot remain invisible in attack it affects only the person or thing upon whom or which it is cast and has a range the interesting thing about the invisibility with a radius is that it doesn't actually say as it would in later editions that it affects basically anyone who's an ally of you within that radius so there's a lot of weird interpretations you can make of this spell including at the most basic level that it doesn't just affect allies it affects everyone within those hundred feet and makes them invisible also does it make things other than people invisible unclear infravision this spell allows the recipient to see infrared light waves and thus enabling him to see in total darkness the duration of one day range of infravision is 40 to 60 feet so interesting thing uh this is actually the first mention of infravision in the book i don't think we specifically touched base on this earlier when we were talking about races but something that may not be immediately apparent is that elves and dwarves and hobbits in od and d have neither low light vision nor infravision they cannot see in the dark you need to have this specific 
specific spell. And again, this is very powerful because the ability to see in the dark in a dungeon made it much easier to sneak up on monsters and also to avoid being detected by monsters and ambushed by them. The slow spell, a broad area spell which affects up to 24 creatures in a maximum area of 6 inches by 12 inches. Again, prodigiously large. Duration of three turns, range of 24 inches. The interesting thing about the slow spell is what does it do? It, it slows you down. What does that mean? I don't think it's ever actually defined. In the same context here that the haste spell is exactly the opposite of a slow spell in effect, but otherwise like it. Note that it will counter its opposite and vice versa. If I was sitting here reading this rulebook for the first time and trying to figure out what effect a slow spell would have and what effect a haste spell would have, I don't know what I would come up with. Uh, I would probably think in terms of like, well, it's talking about speed, so like a slow spell must cause someone to move slower. So maybe their move rate is maybe reduced by one encumbrance category or halved, or they can only take one move action per combat round if you end up interpreting combat in OD&D &D in those terms, which is something we'll talk about later. And a haste spell would potentially have the opposite. You could move maybe twice as far, perhaps. I don't know. Like if you don't have the context of what those spells later evolved into, and probably what Arneson intended with the spells. I, reading this text, I don't know if I was sitting in there in 74 reading this book for the first time, what I would think these spells actually did. Protection from normal missiles. The recipient of this charm becomes impervious to normal missiles. This implies only those missiles projected by normal, not above normal, min and or weapons. Duration of 12 turns, range of 3 inches. Incredibly powerful spell. We talked about this a little bit previously, but both the assumed norms of tabletop play, even if you were using miniatures at the time, but also the theater of the mind, meant that one of the primary advantages that missile users had over melee fighters was the distance at which encounters would begin, which outdoors would be hundreds of feet away, and it could take you several rounds to get within melee range of people with missile weapons. And so those missile weapons were incredibly powerful because you could get so many attacks off before the other for the melee opponents would have any opportunity to close with you, much like historically was the advantage of, you know, ranged weapons. And to have this spell that basically took that whole advantage away and rendered the ranged missile fighters useless against the spellcaster is uh, incredibly powerful. You may also notice, I believe later editions, I'm not sure about 5th edition, but later editions sometimes limited this protection from normal missiles to a self-only spell. In OD&D, you can see that there's really no limit to that and you can really cast it on anybody within three inches, which makes it a much more powerful one as well. Uh, Harlequin81 asks, what is an above normal man, above first level? Yes, most likely. In Chainmail, you would have actually had levels where you had man and then Superman. Um, and you can actually see that. Let's back up to the combat tables here real quick. On um, the level tables, rather. You can see that the fighting capability for various classes were actually defined in these Chainmail terms of man hero and uh, superhero excuse me not superman superhero and so anything anything actually in the range of probably up to third level fighter here where you get this hero minus one would be defined as man even though there's multiple men but you'd also be looking at things like giants hurling boulders as well would also be an obvious example of something that would not be protected from uh, at least that would be my interpretation because one thing we'll note there is like the, the term normal is not necessarily defined so normal might just mean people who don't have magical arrows, or normal might be interpreted as a baseline man combat ratio, or it could just be interpreted as strictly first level. Water breathing. A spell whereby it is possible to breathe underwater without harm or difficulty. Duration 12 turns, range 3 inches. This water breathing spell, along with fly to a lesser extent, is a really good example of spells in this third level range that begin unlocking new adventure possibilities. We'll see this in the third volume of OD&D, &D, but there's actually a whole section about underwater adventures specifically, and the water breathing spell is really the key that unlocks those adventures. The uh, other thing about both of those spells, the fly and the water breathing, is they obviously unlock unusual forms of movement, which will give you advantages as you explore deeper and deeper into the dungeon. Fly can bypass all kinds of dangers on the floor and also maneuver across large vertical differences in obvious ways. And water breathing allows you to potentially penetrate sunken or flooded portions of the dungeon that would otherwise be inaccessible or very difficult to access. Fourth level spells. We are now halfway through the, the magic user spells. Polymorph self. 
a spell allowing the user to take the shape of anything he desires, but he will not thereby acquire the combat abilities of the thing he has polymorphed himself to resemble. That is, while the user may turn himself into a dragon of some type, he will not gain the ability to fight and breathe, but he will be able to fly. Duration of six turns, plus the level of the magic user employing it. One thing that I find very interesting about this phrasing of the polymorph spell is that in many ways it's a lot easier to make rulings on this than some of the immense legalese versions of polymorph more that would come later in the game. I actually use this as an inspiration for revising the third edition polymorph spell to kind of simplify it down to you take on the the physical form of a creature but you lack most of its substance and so you don't get any of its magical abilities other than like its method of movement and speed which is basically what this spell kind of spells out as well because it's another example of, of how much do you unlock what abilities do you unlock and it's one of those spells that infamously as has been said is every time somebody designs a new monster for D&D they are giving a massive power up to polymorph spells. Polymorph others. Unlike the spell uh, to polymorph self, this spell lasts until it is dispelled. This spell gives all characteristics of the form of the creature, so a creature polymorphed into a dragon acquires all of the dragon's ability, not necessarily mentality, however. Likewise, a troll polymorphed into a snail would have an innate resistance to being stepped on and crushed by a normal man. That spell is a little bit less clear about, like, what exactly does it mean for a troll to have an innate resistance resistance to being stepped on and crushed uh, by a normal man. <laughs> Range is six inches. Remove Curse. A spell to remove any one curse or evil sending. Note that using this spell in a cursed sword, for example, would make the weapon an ordinary sword, not some form of enchanted blade. Range adjacent to the object. I love that very specific legalese that it really feels like somebody tried to pull a fast one on either Arneson or Gygax there, and they were not having it. Wall of Fire. The spell will create a wall of fire, which lasts until the magic user no longer concentrates to maintain it. The fire wall is a quake. It prevents creatures from under four hit dice from entering slash passing through it. Undead will take two dice of damage and other creatures one die when breaking through the fire. The shape of the wall can be either a plane of up to six inches width and two inches in height, or it can be cast in a circle of three inches diameter and two inches in height at a range of six inches. We also have the Wall of Ice spell, a spell to create a wall of ice six inches thick in dimensions like that of a wall of fire. It negates the effects of creatures employing fire and or fire spells. It may be broken through by creatures with four or more hit dice with damage equal to one die for non-fire employing creatures and double that for fire users range of 12 inches. Both of these spells in many way are the, in terms of functionality in the dungeon, are the improved version of wizard lock. Now you can begin blocking off corridors in a dungeon and controlling monsters pursuit without needing to find a door first. Confusion. This spell will immediately affect creatures with two or fewer hit dice. For creatures above two hit dice, the following formula is used to determine when the spell takes effect. Score of a 12-sided die roll less the level of the magic user casting the spell equals delay in effect, i.e. a positive difference means a turn delay, while a zero or negative difference means neg immediate effect. Creatures with an, like, all of that, and you probably could have just had a saving throw. Creatures with four or more hit dice will have saving throws against magic, and on those turns they make their saving throws they are not confused, but this check must be made each turn the spell lasts, and failure means that they are confused. The spell will affect as many creatures as indicated by the score rolled on two six-sided dice, with an addition of plus one for each level above the eight that the magic user casting the spell has attained. Confused creatures will attack the magic user's party on a dice score of two to five, stand around doing nothing six to eight, or attack each other nine to twelve, roll each turn, duration twelve turns, and a range of twelve inches. Also not safe for work. I like the fact that because the artist only could really draw one face, it's really just the same person in different phases of a professional career. Charm Monster. The counterpart of a charm person spell which is employable against all creatures. If animals or creatures with three or fewer hit dice are involved, determine how many are affected by the spell by rolling three six-sided dice. It is otherwise identical to the charm person spell. Not much to say about that. Another example of an improved spell, higher level. Growth of Plants. This spell causes normal brush or woods to become thickly overgrown and entangles with creepers, vines, thorns, briars, and so on, so as to make the area virtually impassable. It will affect an area of up to 30 square inches, the dimensions decided by the caster of the spell, duration until the spell is negated by a dispel magic, and a range of 12 inches. So another example of, uh, it's kind of very similar to the wall spells at this same level. Again, it gives you area control and the ability to modify your environment to your advantage. 
Dimension Door, a limited teleport spell which allows the object to be instantaneously transported to 36 inches in any direction, including up or down. There is no chance of misjudging when using a Dimension Door, so the user always arrives exactly where he calls, i.e. 12 inches upwards, 32 inches each, etc., range of 1 inch. Now, he says that there is no chance of misjudging when using a Dimension Door, so the user always arrives exactly where he calls, but then he calls for exact measurements to be declared by the caller, the person describing how the spell is being used in an environment where they might not have access to precise measurements. So I think that's an interesting thing to note there is that even though you may think you're putting it in the right place, if you don't understand or estimate the distance incorrectly, that might not actually be true in practice. Wizard Eye, a spell which allows the user to send a visual sensor up to 24 inches away in order to observe the scene without himself moving. The eye is invisible, it moves 12 inches per turn, and the duration has 6 turns. So a more powerful version of Clairvoyance. Mass Morph, this spell is used to conceal up to 100 men or creatures of near man size as a woods or orchard. The concealed figures may be moved through without being detected as anything other than trees, and it will not affect the spell. It will be negated by a command from the caster or by means of a dispel magic spell with a range of 24 inches. This is one of those spells that really reveals the difference in how D&D was being played back in the day, because now around this fourth level time period you're beginning to get up towards the levels where you would either have yourself or be adventuring with other PCs who were unlocking their baronies and their churches and their wizard's towers, and all the followers and armies that would come with that. We talked before about how in Dave Arneson's original Blackmore game, the idea was that you would go on these dungeon adventures to build resources and abilities and acquire equipment that would allow you to build an army that would allow you to go and fight in the war game. That was sort of the cap over all of this. And you can see how a spell like Mass Morph is really assuming that the PCs are going to be in situations where they're going to be with small armed forces of up to 100 men, where it may be useful to hide them as an orchard, and thereby ambush, surprise, or bypass opposition. Hallucinatory Terrain. By means of this spell, terrain features can either be hidden or created, an illusion which affects a large area. Thus a swamp, hill, ridge, woods, or the like can be concealed or made to appear. The spell is broken when the magic area is contacted by the opponent, range 24 inches. Uh, another example of a spell that's going to be primarily useful for army-based play. Fifth level. Teleport. Instantaneous transportation from place to place, regardless of the distance involved, provided the user knows where he is going, the topography of the arrival area. Without certain knowledge of the destination, teleportation is 75% uncertain, so a score of less than 75% on the percentile dice results in death. Okay, well make sure you know where you're going. If the user is aware of the general topography of his destination but has not carefully studied it, there is an uncertainty factor of 10% low and 10% high. A low score meaning death if solid material is contacted. A high score indicates a fall from 10 to 100 feet, also possibly resulting in death. If a careful study of the destination has been previously made, then the magic user has only a 1% chance of teleporting low and a 4% chance of coming in high at a distance to 10 to 40 feet. I do like the elegance of the distance of the fall being determined directly by the percentile roll. It just means one die roll instead of several, which would, would become in later additions. The other thing about teleport is that this is an example of a spell uh, that basically sunsets certain modes and styles of play. Once you have unlocked teleportation, and particularly mass teleport a little while later, you no longer really need to go on overland journeys the way that you used to, and a certain element of the game vanishes. This is also beneficial in terms of getting even deeper into the dungeon. There are also limitations in terms, at, at, with the base spell here, of needing to go someplace you've been before, but the game is sort of sunsetting out these components, and this is an interesting design feature of D&D that goes hand in hand with the fact that original Dungeons and Dragons was moving through different modes of play. So you started out in a dungeon and then you began doing wilderness exploration and hex crawls and then you founded a barony and a kingdom and then you went to go fight with armies and so forth. And so the form and style of play would shift over time. The assumed form of play was an open table. And when you're dealing with an open table like that, an individual player would usually have characters of, of many different levels, assuming they've been playing for a while. And so to some extent you could kind of select, well, what type of adventures do I want to go on? today? Do I want to be dealing with my 
organizational play, my realm-based play? Do I want to be going on a hex crawl adventure and play my mid-level character? Or do I want to go on dungeon adventures and probably play my low or mid-level character and, and so forth? And the advantage of a spell like Teleport is say, well, we've now reached the levels with this character where we're, we're, we're really interested in this realm-based play. So it's okay to introduce a spell now that basically says we can skip all that travel stuff that we were doing in the previous levels. You'll see this in AD&D and later editions of the game as well as spells like create food and water and the like things that remove some of the resource management that was a key component of mounting dungeon and then wilderness expeditions those spells are moving those components because we've moved on to worrying about other things and having a diegetic reason to basically say let's stop worrying about that and focus on the next phase of play is interesting what happens when you take these same spells that were designed to sunset previous modes of play as we move into new modes of play and you leave those spells in Attacked, but then you get rid of the other modes of play, and now no matter what level you are in D&D, you are supposedly going on dungeon crawls, because that's the core identity of the game, for better or for worse. What happens is that these spells become incredibly problematic. A common problem in 3rd edition that's never really been fully solved is the, the scry and die problem, where you use a scry spell to figure out where you want to go, and then you teleport in and you rapidly kill everything, and then you teleport out without any real risk to yourself per se, creating a magical arms race that isn't really what the game is designed to handle. And the reason for that is because you are using spells designed to obviate forms of gameplay, even though you are now playing the game in a form that says that those forms of play are in fact what we want to be doing. And that mismatch of expectation and mechanical design is something that D&D really continues to struggle with at sort of its basic DNA level as it moves into high mid and, and high tier play. Uh, Avian Overlord asks, did that going up to armies and castles thing ever work? I know that it didn't for uh, a lot of people. There is a fundamental tension within D&D &D in this regard, where the game was designed and has mechanical systems for that assumption that you're moving from one mode of play to a higher mode of play to a higher mode of play. But even though the game is fundamentally designed to do that, that's what the game was originally designed to do for, it still has these mechanics, which in vestigial form are designed to support those styles of play. For better or for worse, there's a lot of people who aren't interested in that style of play. And they really do just want to stay in the dungeon and do dungeon crawls. You can see that going all the way back to Dave Arneson's table itself. So Dave Arneson's table has Team Good and Team Evil. You belong to a team. They're leveling up. They're doing all this army-based play. There's real meaningful consequences in the campaign world that are happening as a result. But at the same time, a lot of the stories that the old guard players who were playing with Arneson back then will tell, they'll say things like, well, Greg Svensson, who was one of the original players, it was really smart because he managed to make sure that his wizard never leveled up high enough that he needed to level out the top of that scale and kind of retire from dungeon play and retire from play. And so there's that tension, that constant tension between from the very beginning of wanting to stay in the dungeon and kind of just do that and then leveling up to the higher forms of play. And so I think a, uh, there's a large component of D&D &D as a fan base that wants to stay in the dungeon. They, and I, the one way I put this too is I, long ago I wrote an article on the Alexandrian called D&D &D Calibrating Your expectations, which took a close look at third edition, which was an edition that really benchmarked its mechanics to real world measurements. And so you kind of get a real feel for like what the mechanics were. And one of the things you can conclude from that is if you look at like, for example, things that like the fictional character of Aragorn or Conan or Farford and the Grey Mouse would do in their books, you can really conclude that those stories are being told about low mid-level tier D, D PCs, characters who are like fifth to sixth level. And that's kind of where those stories are. A lot of people want to play those stories, and when they level up, they don't want to change into stories that aren't about those types of adventures, even as they unlock abilities like teleport or meteor swarm or turn yourself into a god that really kind of aren't compatible with Aragorn or Farfoot and the Grey Mouser. And so that is one wing of the hobby. And the one exception to that, that wing of the hobby generally wants to play Aragorn and Farfoot and the Grey Mouser they don't want to level up to godhood, but they do want to be able to solo smog. That's the level up that they're interested in seeing. Is they, they, they still want the tavern door to be difficult to pick the lock on because they're not superhuman. But at the same time, they want to be able to solo smog. And that's kind of a weird dichotomy as well, but it's something that's a real play style that I think a lot of people buy into. 
Herbivore says people want to play Aragorn the Ranger, not Aragorn the King. Yes, I think that's true. But that being said, there is a large percentage of the hobby that is interested in playing those higher forms of play, having their characters level up, and move into different structures of adventures. And this is one of the reasons why the sort of realms-based play of D&D has never actually caught on in my opinion, whereas OD&D and most editions of D&D up until 4th edition do a pretty good job of explaining how a dungeon crawl works. They explain how you're supposed to play it, and they explain how you're supposed to prep it, and they explain how you're supposed to run it. They really tell you how to design dungeon adventures. The realms-based mechanics and how you design a realms-based game both was never as clearly understood, for starters. Two was more difficult to reach in the early days of the game, particularly after Supplement 1 slowed down XP progression quite a bit. And then as a result of those systems never being really all that well defined in terms of what you prep and how you run them, and also how you play them, because those things were never well defined, nor well supported through published modules. Dungeons were published in all kinds of modules. This realm style of play wasn't really supported in published form. As a result, people weren't really doing that. And because people weren't really doing that, including the Young Turk designers who were moving in to design D&D itself, because they weren't doing that, the support for that in the rule books became increasingly vestigial in its nature. And the more vestigial it came, the less it explained how to run those types of games, the less the rule books explained how to run them, the fewer people who did it. For a contrast, you can look at games, even today, which are specifically designed to support these styles of play. One example is Ars Magica, which is a game we published at Atlas Games. Ars Magica was designed by Jonathan Tweet, who would later go on to co-design 3rd edition D&D, and also Mark Reinhagen, who would later go on to design the World of Darkness and Vampire the Masquerade and the Storyteller system. And those two designers in the 80s designed Ars Magica, which was a game where everybody played a wizard, and the wizards were gathered together into a covenant, which was basically an organization or a realm, and a lot of the play of the game was based around organizing and running your covenant in much the same fashion that you might run a baron or the like. I guess that's the other thing I'll also note, too, is that one of the reasons why Ars Magica succeeds at this in a way that D&D frequently doesn't is that the baronial-level structures of D&D were frequently about solo play. If we go back to the beginning of this book and take a peek at the classes, the Fighting Man, for example, it says, Top-level fighters, lords and above, who build castles are considered barons, and as such they may invest in their holdings in order to increase their income. A base income for a baron is a tax rate of 10 gold pieces, etc. Clerics have the same thing, but they... they they attract religious followers and they get tithes instead. Now the interesting thing about that it is not a group activity. The group doesn't unlock baronial play. The specific player who is playing that fighter unlocks their baron. Meanwhile, the cleric is unlocking their church, and they're not the same thing, and they aren't connected. And the reason that would work at Dave Arneson's Blackmore table, or Mark Miller's Traveler table, or Gygax's Greyhawk table, these early campaigns, is because they were these open tables. And so you weren't playing the same character all the time. There wasn't an expectation that everyone was part of a group who'd be adventuring and meeting at the same time. And so when you graduated to baronial level play, you could have specific sessions dedicated to your barony, you could talk to the DM outside of those sessions, and those decisions you made in those other sessions would impact games being played by lower level characters as you shaped the environment around them, which was an incredibly empowering sense to be kind of in a co-authorial role at that point with the DM, where other people are adventuring in the realms that you create and control and rule. That doesn't work when you begin moving out of that open table style of play that dominated the 70s and even the first couple years of the 80s and begin moving into dedicated tables with linear adventures. Because now these same mechanics that say, well, the fighter gets a barony and the cleric gets a church and the other fighter gets a different barony, those mechanics are not really compatible with six people sitting down to play a game together. Whereas in Ars Magica, all of the wizard characters controlled by the PCs are all members of the same covenant and they're working together at the same thing. So if you instead had these mechanics that would say you as a group are now running a barony, they might have been more durable in the traditions and lore of D&D. And certainly, if I was going to be looking at how to add these elements back into D&D, that would be the approach I would take. It would look much more at a group level rather than individual character classes, because the dedicated table is the more assumed style of play. Whereas, like I say, if you look at the mechanics in OD&D and AD&D, that is not the case for how those mechanics rolled out. And I know for myself personally, back in the late 80s and early 90s, when I first 
started playing D&D with the Beckme set, the basic expert companions, masters, and immortals rules. When I was playing with those rules, which similarly had a, at certain levels, you unlock these things. And I actually, for the first and only time in my life, played a character from first level up to 36th level, actually several characters because of the way that we were playing. And in kind of an open table fashion, we all kind of multiple DMs. Even in that context, I would still unlock those things and spend a lot of time in my own personal solo play time designing my Thieves, Thieves Guild and designing my Fighters, Barony, and Castle. But those things rarely had an impact into play. But I think it's also the interesting aspect of how Matt Colville approached Strongholds and Followers was he really looked at, okay, well, if you have this kingdom, but you're still going on those dungeon adventures that everybody wants to go on, how can your castle help with the adventures that you're going on? We'll be talking about realm space play even more as we move forward. Hold monster. Same as hold person, but applicable to monsters. In this case, you pretty much have to assume that monsters is basically anything hold person doesn't affect. Uh, again, monsters is not a term of art, really, per se. Conjure elemental. A spell to conjure an air, water, fire, or earth elemental. Only one of each type can be conjured by a magic user during any one day. The elemental will remain until dispelled, but the magic user must concentrate on control or the elemental will turn upon its conjurer and attack him. See Chainmail. Conjured elementals are the strongest with 16 hit dice, as is explained in Volume 2, Monsters and Treasure, range of 24 inches. So here we again see kind of this, this Chainmail legacy on the magic system of D&D as well. We haven't been talking a lot about Chainmail, because there'll be a whole different video, but Chainmail's magicians did have a list of spells, several of which are drawn from that kind of directly into D&D. I believe Fireball is one of them, and Conjure Elemental, as they allude to here, is another. And it's kind of interesting, because you look around, and in modern D&D, when you see kind of a Conjure Elemental type spell, I think modern but anything after ODD. It's just one of many different conjuration spells, but this is really the first time we've seen a spell that conjures something from beyond. And the reason we're seeing that is because in Chainmail, they had a spell that allowed you to conjure additional forces onto the field in the form of of elementals. That war game legacy continues to be kind of baked into the D&D down onto today. Telekinesis. By means of this spell, objects may be moved by mental force. Weight limits are calculated by multiplying the level of the magic user by 200 gold pieces weight. Thus, a necromancer is able to move a weight equal to 2,000 gold pieces. Once again, you can really kind of see, this is another example of a spell both obviating certain difficulties you would have had at lower levels. Like, if, if you actually play an open table original D&D campaign with strictly enforced encumbrance, you will discover how often that encumbrance creates meaningful choices on expedition, because you've gone out to retrieve things of value. Those things of value can be a variety of weights, and you have a limited capacity to carry those things back to civilization and profit from them. And so a lot of interesting decisions will be made along those lines. In this case, you can begin bypassing some of those limits to, to a certain extent. Transmute rock to mud. The spell takes effect in one turn, turning earth, sand, and of course, rock to mud. The area effect is up to 30 inch square inches. Creatures moving into the mud will become mired, possibly sinking if heavy enough, or losing 90% of movement otherwise, unless able to fly or to levitate. The spell can only be counted by reversing the incantation, requiring a transmute rock to mud spell, or by a normal process of evaporation. 3 to 18 days is determined by rolling three six-sided dice. We now have two more wall spells. Higher level wall spells are going to create a wall of stone which is two feet thick with a maximum length and height equaling 10 square inches, and also a wall of iron, which can be slightly smaller, but most likely stronger as well. These continue to be improved versions of previous spells. In this case, the previous wall spells that we've talked about. Animate dead. The creation of animated skeletons or zombies. It in no way brings a creature back to life. For the number of dead animated, simply roll one die for every level above the eight the magic user is. Thus, a sorcerer gets one die, or from one to six animated dead. Note that the skeletons or dead bodies must be available in order to animate them. The spell lasts until dispelled, or the animated dead are done away with. You may also notice that unlike later versions of the spell, there's no limit to how many undead you can create as a result, assuming you cast the spell multiple times. This is also another example of a battlefield primarily type of spell that then later gets kind of diegetically merged into D&D in general. But yeah, I mean, the idea here is that you're on the battlefield with an army, uh, there's a bunch of dead people laying around, and you can basically raise up a new force uh, midway through the battle here as well. Hulk May one points out that in fact, it doesn't say anything about being in control of the animated dead at all. The animated just come back and uh, they're alive and boy that's a good point i guess you better use it in combination with charm monster spells to get them to like you although i think actually no the 
undead are, are immune to charm monster spells. So definitely a risky spell, depending on how much of a uh, how much your your GM goes by the book here. Magic jar. By means of this device, the magic user houses his life force in some inanimate object, even a rock, and attempts to possess the body of any other creature within 12 inches of his magic jar. The container for his life force must be within three inches of his body at the time the spell is pronounced. Possession of another body takes place when the creature in question fails to make its saving throw against magic. If the possessed body is destroyed, the spirit of the magic user returns to the magic jar, and from thence it may attempt another possession or return to the magic user's body. The spirit of the magic user can return to the magic jar at any time he so desires. And note that if the body of the magic user is destroyed, the life force must remain in a possessed body or the magic jar. If the magic jar is destroyed, the magic user is totally annihilated. When I was a kid, I was deeply fascinated by the magic jar spell in Beck Me. I believe it, it's it's a spell that's taken directly from a fantasy story that I believe Gygax had read that gives some explanation of why the spell exists. It's a very oddly specific spell. I think one of the reasons I was fascinated by it as a kid was that it's so clearly very different from the combat and exploration-oriented spells that are otherwise present in the game. Contact Higher Plane. This spell allows the magical type to seek advice and gain knowledge from creatures inhabiting higher higher planes of existence, the referee. Of course, the higher the plane contacted, the greater the number of questions that can be asked, the greater the chance that the information will be known, and the higher the probability that the question will be answered truthfully. Use the table below to determine these factors, as well as the probability of the magic user going insane. Only questions can be which can be answered yes or no are permitted. If the magic user goes insane, he will remain so for a number of weeks equal to the number of the plane he was attempting to contact, the strain making him totally incapacitated until the time has elapsed. For each level above the 11th, magic users should only have a 5% better chance of retaining their sanity. The spell is usable only once every game week at the referee's option. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. This is kind of the highest level of the divination spells that we're talking about. Of course, the divination school didn't exist yet, but this is a spell that lets you find out kind of anything you want as long as you're willing to take a sufficient efficient risk of doing so. The other thing to note here is that the modern conception of D&D's planar cosmology didn't actually exist yet. There were no outer planes or inner planes. But in this case, you can see there's just kind of a generic sense of these higher planes of existence. But I think it's actually a really interesting epoch in D&D. It wasn't until a Dragon Magazine article that Gygax began nailing down the exact cosmology of what would become the Great Wheel, which was then incorporated into the AD&D core rulebooks. But before that, there was this concept of sort of different planes of existence, which in some cases were just alternate, like alternate realities. In other cases were this higher planes of reality from which higher powers could descend or communicate. But the interesting thing was that in those days, if you look at like these mid to late 70s, time period for modules and setting materials and so forth from both TSR and others, it was really clear that whenever somebody kind of wanted another plane of existence for any reason, they would just, you know, make one up. But only later in AD&D, really, did Gygax kind of lock down what that cosmology was. And once the cosmology was locked down, D&D, by and large, stopped making new planes. They locked everything into this cosmology, for better or for worse. And so the kitchen sinkness of D&D, which was a wide open kitchen sink, toss any fantasy stuff you want in there at the beginning of D&D, slowly ossifies over time and becomes rigid and less accepting of new things. And, and more and more you are playing with a D&D cosmology, which becomes more and more set in terms of its can canonicity. Iconoplast then mentions as we're about to get into Passwall here. Passwall being a spell which opens a hole in a solid rock wall, man sized up to 10 inches in length, duration 3 turns, range 3 inches. Iconoplast mentions it's strange that Passwall is at such a high level. It makes sense since it deliberately bypasses dungeons, but it means that I make a hole for half an hour is as difficult as I talk to angels or I possess you. Absolutely. This is a classic example of a spell that exists at this level, much like those other spells we were talking about, specifically to, to some extent, bypass lower levels of play. A dungeon based play is just less important at this level, so we're going to give you some tools to bypass it in new and, and potentially interesting ways, which is what Passwall kind of lets you do. And there's always this tension in terms of balancing things like what levels should the spell be between the dramatist, the simulationist, and the gamist, to use those terms in the old threefold method and not the GNS method for the for, for people who that distinction makes any difference for. The gamist in this case is saying, well, you can't give Passwall to first level characters or even fifth level characters because they're still in dungeons. And if you let people just drill holes through dungeons, the dungeon breaks. The structure of the dungeon adventure breaks and we don't want that. In much the same way that teleporting, particularly when you get to like teleport without air, you've kind of broken hex crawling as an adventure structure. On the other side, you have sort of the simulationist impulse, which says, well, why is making a hole in the wall as difficult as I talk to angels or I possess you? 
Like, it's a good question. I think it's also like, there's also a gameless aspect of like, I'm going to punch a hole in the wall, but it's going to go away. Why does it go away? Well, because the DM doesn't want to redraw his maps for the next party that goes through this dungeon. Cloud Kill. This spell creates a moving poisonous cloud of vapor, which is deadly to all creatures with less than five hit dice. The movement is six inches per turn, according to wind direction or directly away from the spellcaster if there is no wind. Dimensions three inches in diameter. The duration is six turns, but the cloud is dispelled by unusually strong winds or trees. Note that the cloud is heavier than air so it will sink to the lowest possible level another example of a spell that's really designed for sort of army based play you send that sweeping out over the low level armies it does have in this edition and it retained much longer than its compatriots of fireball and lightning bolt a potential drawback of the wind changing and blowing your cloud kill back over the top of you we next have a feeble mind spell a spell usable only against magic users it causes the recipient to become feeble minded until the spell is counted with a dispel magic because of its specialized nature the feeble mind spell has a 20 percent better chance of success i.e it lowers the magic user's saving throw against magic by four so that if normally a 12 or better were required to save against magic a 16 would be required against a feeble mind range 24 inches You'll notice that there is actually no definition given for exactly what being feeble-minded means. Growth of animals. A spell which will cause from one to six normal-sized animals, not merely mammals, to grow to giant size with proportionate attack capabilities. Duration of 12 turns and a range of 12 inches. You'll notice that once again you do not actually control the animal as a natural part of the spell. Sixth level. So we're on a, this is again our last level of spells for the magic user in OD&D. Stone to flesh. This spell turns stone to flesh and it is reversible. So as a, so as to turn flesh to stone. It is particularly useful in reviving characters who have been stoned by some monster. It is permanent unless a reversed spell is used. Range 12 inches. Really missed out on the possibility of making the range 420 feet, but reincarnation a spell to bring a dead character back to life in some other form the form in which the character is reincarnated is dependent upon his former alignment law neutrality or chaos use a random determination on the character alignment table and whatever the result is the reincarnated character is that creature and must play as is if he comes back as a man determine which class and roll a six-sided die to determine which level in that class and similarly check level for reincarnation as an elf or a dwarf the notable thing here of course is that the raised dead spell is cleric only reincarnation is a higher level spell with some pretty dramatic drawbacks but the magic user is allowed to get access to it here invisible stalker the conjuration of an extra dimensional monster which can be controlled with merely a word from the magic user who conjured him the invisible stalker will continue on its mission until it is accomplished regardless of time or distance they cannot be dispelled once conjured except through attack details of the invisible stalker itself will be found in the next volume Lower Water. Utterance of this spell causes the water level in a river or similar body of liquid to drop 50% of its depth for 10 turns, range of 24 inches. Again, another clear example of a spell that's designed for kind of realms-based play, and potentially some wilderness examples where that might make forging the, affording the river a little bit uh, easier, but most likely it's designed to make the river easier to ford for entire bodies of troops or to reduce the effectiveness of a moat in a siege situation. Part Water, a spell which will part water up to 10 feet deep for a maximum of 6 turns, range 12 inches. Same thing. Projected Image. By means of this spell, the magic user projects an image of himself up to 24 inches away, and all spells and the like used thereafter appear to originate from the projected image. Duration 6 turns, range 24 inches. That is a surprisingly high level for projected image. Uh, one interesting thing that happens in later editions, I think it's been largely smoothed away post-2000, is that mirror image crops up as sort of a localized projected image, but then great effort is made to explain why projected image is such a high-level spell if the wizard has access to a mirror image. And there'll be a whole bunch of those sort of iterations on spells trying to distinguish and make clear exactly what the utility of one spell versus the other spell is. Anti-Magic Shell. A field which surrounds the magic user and makes him totally impervious to all spells. It also prevents any spells from being sent through the shell by the magic user who conjured it. Duration of 12 turns. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Nice straightforward little spell. Death Spell. An incantation which kills from 2 to 16 creatures with fewer than 7 hit dice. The creatures must be within an area of 6 inches by 6 inches to come under the spell, range of 24 inches. So you can really see here, Death Spell is just a straight up superior sleep spell. Another classic example of a very powerful spell. The other thing to keep in mind too, as we look at these 6th level spells, is going back to the fact that in OD&D, 6th level is as high as the spells get. If we go back to our spell list here, we can see magic users head first to 6th level spells, 7th, 8th, uh, and ninth level spells that didn't exist 
the six level spells exist in very much kind of the same place that ninth level spells exist for the rest of the history of the game. These are the top level abilities. Your character is as powerful as they will ever become. And yeah, they can just kill a bunch of people or they can, you know, summon an invisible stalker to go and do anything for them or reincarnate people from the dead. This was the epitome. This was the top level. And I think there's really actually something interesting to then go and look at seventh, eighth and ninth level spells that were later created, including some of these that got moved up into those levels and saying, OK, well, these are these are the things they came up with. And they said, OK, well, how do we do even more powerful than the most powerful we previously imagined? And when you understand that that's where seventh, eighth and ninth level spells came from, it really begins to kind of make some sense about why those spells get as gonzo as they can. Gios, a spell which forces the recipient to perform some task as desired by the magic user casting the Gios. Any attempt to deviate from the performance of the task will result in weakness, and ignoring the Gios entirely brings death. The referee must carefully adjudicate the casting and subsequent performance of the Gios individual when this spell is used. Duration until the task is completed with a range of three inches. I don't have anything interesting to say about that one. I think it's kind of a cool ability. I mean, to some extent, it's even, it's arguably, depending on how you interpret charm person, Gias in some ways can be weaker than that, depending on how powerful you interpret charm person. But the death penalty is certainly a way of really, depending on other interpretations, you have charm, hold person, and then this Gias is the most powerful form of a mental compulsion spell. Disintegrate. This spell will cause material of any kind other than that of a magical nature to disintegrate. It will blast a tree, dragon, if it fails to make its saving throw against magic, wall section, or whatever. Range of six inches. So you've got the death spell that targets a whole bunch of... I mean, seven hit dice is pretty powerful in terms of the level of creatures it's killing. So that's, that's a pretty powerful spell. Or you have Disintegrate, which can take out any single creature plus a bunch of other cool stuff as well. Move Earth. When above ground, the magic user may utilize this spell to move prominences such as hills or ridges to move. I feel like there should be a cause in there someplace. The spell takes one turn to go into effect. The, the terrain affected will move at a rate of six inches per turn. Duration of six turns. Range of 24 inches. So you can really see this is the I command this battlefield spell. And I can probably make your castle disappear as well if you don't have some defenses for it. Control weather. The magic user can perform any one of the following weather control operations with this spell. Rains, stop rain, cold wave, heat wave, tornado, stop tornado, deep clouds, and clear sky. I love the beautiful simplicity of that version of control weather, actually. A spell that gets surprising amounts of complexity later on. I like how it just kind of glosses right over the top of tornado. Like, hang on, I, I need more information. As Radio Desk says, tornado and the ever important follow up, stop the tornado. Harlequin 81, I see, is beginning to talk about the amazing piece of elf art. Uh, he mentions the one tiny leg. I am amazed by the incredibly large beard that the elves have in OD&D. Every time I look at that image, the first thing I think is dwarf, and that may just be the fabulous beard. But that is clearly labeled elf. As far as anyone is ever concerned, it is not a, a thing to be corrected. You can see in the sixth printing here, with all the errata in it, this is still an elf down to the dying days of OD&D. That has brought us to the end of the magic user spells for OD&D. As we can see, there's, a, there's going to be launching into the cleric spells. There'll be fewer of those. Clerics only got access to their spells at second level. In addition to that, they have fewer levels of spells than the magic users we just looked at, as well as fewer number of spells at each of those levels. Even as early as OD&D, though, there is a clear distinction between the spells which magic users can cast and the spells which clerics can cast, with clerics having access to, as we start off here on first level, the various cure spells, like cure light wounds. During the course of one full turn, this spell will remove hits from a wounded character, including elves, dwarves, etc. A die is rolled, one pip added, and the resultant total subtracted from the hit points the character has taken. Thus, from two to seven hit points of damage can be removed. Only clerics had access to healing magic like this. That was the biggest distinction between the two of them. You'll see from actually the, the very shortened spell lists of the clerics in this edition that they were very heavily focused on a very small range of spells in a way that would become less and less true with every passing edition as the cleric spell list expanded to incorporate more and more of the utility that magic user spells have. Although over time the clerics nevertheless clung tenaciously to their monopoly over the uh, cure type spells. One interesting thing looking at the cure spells here in 
uh, OD&D is that quite a lot rides on the definition of the word turn, which as we'll discover in future books is something of a complicated and confusing term in terms of how Gygax and Arneson use it in their books. Turns can refer to either 10 minutes, but they'll also refer to turns in combat, which are what we would now refer to as rounds. Rounds in combat generally being uh, 10 rounds to one turn, but they just refer to them all as turns in OD&D, as we'll see later. And so this spell either can be used during combat or it can't and can only be used outside of combat with a long-term heal over a significantly longer period of time. Maybe we'll discover something as we do this really kind of close read that we're doing, but as far as I can tell, there's nothing in these in these original books that kind of clarifies which one of those two things would be true, and those would result in two very different dynamics, in my opinion, in terms of how combat would play out in a game. If you can heal up in the middle of combat, that's hugely useful in keeping people alive. If you can't do that, then people are much more fragile. It also, however, it does suggest that some spells like we were looking at earlier with the magic user, things like wizard locking doors for a full turn, for example, would be significant because you could lock the door, wizard lock it, and the cleric could begin casting their full turn, not combat turn, but full turn healing spells, if that's the way you chose to interpret the spells. The other interesting aspect of that is that in combat, if you assume that cure spells can't be cast in combat because they take too long, then the cleric can't turn into a heal bot during combat. They don't have to dedicate all their actions to that because they can't dedicate their actions to that and as a result they're more likely to be engaged in that Charlemagne Knights paradigm that we talked about earlier the stuff that was later purloined by the paladin they'd be much more likely to kind of engage in, in the front lines of combat up with the fighters next up we have purify food and water this spell will make spoiled or poisoned wa food and water usable the quantity subject to a single spell is approximately that which would serve a dozen people very useful spell the key thing I love about this spell as opposed to like the higher level create food and water is that you have to still have access to spoiled or poisoned food and water. You have to have some base resource that you can transform into a more useful resource. Detect Magic. This spell is that the is the same as that for magic users. This is actually a classic example. We talked at the beginning of the stream about different ways of organizing spell sections and how when you organize spell sections like this, where you go by class and then level, and then in the case of OD&D, you don't even bother alphabetizing the spells, cross-references to other spells can be difficult to track down. In this case, Detect Magic isn't too bad, but if you don't know what level Detect Magic is for magic users, since spells can have different levels for different classes and you're a cleric and you look at this and it says you know go look up detect magic you could be hunting for a while trying to figure out exactly where detect magic is detect evil this spell is the same as that for magic users except that it has a duration of six turns and a range of 12 inches protection from evil this spell is the same as that for magic users except that it lasts for 12 turns Light. This spell is the same as that for magic users, except that it has a basic duration of 12 turns. It's interesting that they are still, in this edition and later editions all the way up to third, still trying to find ways in which his clerics and wizards kind of have the same have, have the same spells, but we want them to have at least slightly slight differences between them. They're, they're not the same. They're not casting the exact same spells. These are different spells, and we're going to try to distinguish them in some way. Second level find traps. By means of this spell, the cleric will locate any mechanical or magical traps within a radius of three inches. The spell lasts two turns. That is an incredibly useful divination spell in old school dungeons. Just flat out. Hold person. This spell is the same as that for magic uses, except that its duration is nine turns and its range is 18 inches. Another example of one of those. Bless. During any turn, the prospective recipients of a bless spell are not in combat. The cleric may give them this benison. A blessing raises morale by plus one and also adds plus one to attack dice. The spell lasts six turns. So here again, we come back to this duration of turns which is not well defined. When it, when it says during any turn that the prospective recipients are not in combat, do they mean, we're gonna use the term round for what the game sometimes refers to as combat turns. Do they mean rounds? Do they mean that any round he can do this? Or does it mean that any dungeon turn, a full turn that you're not actually fighting, I can drop this bless on you and it will last for up to six six dungeon turns? Or does it last for six rounds? 
Speak with animals. This spell allows the cleric to speak with any form of animal life, understanding what they say in reply. There is a possibility that the animals spoken with will perform services for the cleric and they will never attack the party the cleric is with. The manner of handling the probabilities of action by animals is discussed in the next volume. Duration of six turns and range of three inches. This is actually an example of the, the specific line about the manner of handling the probabilities of action by animals is discussed in the next volume. This is an example of a design ethos in early D&D, which is that some information about the world will be hidden from the players. It's going to be over in that other book that the players aren't supposed to be reading or don't have access to. And so you can talk to animals, but you won't necessarily know what the mechanics are that the dungeon master is using to determine how they're going to help you. This is a simple example of that, but we'll see many more examples of that, where you have sort of what I refer to as player unknown structures, where the dungeon master is given tools to help interpret and run the game world that the players are not privy to. And some of that is just, you know, hiding the wizard behind the curtain. If you knew the simple metrics that I'm using, the game world would feel less real to you. Or you'd be able to manipulate the world in ways that wouldn't be simulationist and accurate. And other concerns are gamist. I'm going to hide this information from you for the same reason that I hide my hands in poker. I'm going to use concealed information to create enigma and mystery that will create challenges for you to overcome. Third level, remove curse. This spell is the same as that for magic users. Cure disease, a spell which cures any form of disease. The spell is the only method to rid a character of a disease from a curse for example, which is an interesting thing to put right next to the remove curse spell because it implies that you can't use remove curse to remove curses that are diseases, despite the fact that the wizard spell doesn't say that, if I recall correctly. Locate object. This spell is the same as that for magic users, except the base range is nine. Continual light is the same as that for magic users, except that light shed is equal to full daylight, which is where the daylight spell eventually comes from, that distinction of different qualities of light. Fourth level, neutralize poison, a spell to counter the harmful effects of poison. Poison. Note that it will not aid a character killed by poison, however. It will affect only one object. Duration of one turn. Cure serious wounds. This spell is like a light wound spell, but the effects are double, so two dice are rolled and one pip is added to each die. Therefore, from four to 14 hit points will be removed by this spell. That's an interesting phrasing, right? That the hit points will be removed. For the most part, OD&D has already settled into the idea that hit points are a thing your character has and you lose them to damage and regain them back up to a maximum. But there are points where you can see an understanding that would date back to certain war games where you would suffer hits. And so you'd basically start with the concept of having zero hits. You would take hits until you reached your maximum number of hits, and then you would die. And that's kind of an interesting, yeah, Holoquin says the old hits to kill terminology, exactly, HTK, which crops up in quite a few 70s RPGs as well. The war games that the people creating the RPGs were also simultaneously playing. Protection from evil 10-foot radius, same as for magic users, turn sticks to snakes. Anytime there are sticks nearby, a cleric can turn them into snakes, with a 50% chance that they will be poisonous. From 2 to 16 snakes can be conjured, roll two eight-sided dice. He can command these conjured snakes to perform as he orders, a duration of six turns and a range of 12 inches. The obvious influence there is Moses himself. Certainly directly from the Bible, but I, I certainly think probably the Ten Commandments movie with Charlton Heston probably plays a, a visual image here. One of the things that's interesting about, about the 70s is that there is, compared to today, such a paucity of fantastic material that those who were interested in these kinds of fantastical stories really just were like thirsty men in the desert, kind of drinking up everything that they could. The influences were both smaller in scale of what you could draw influence from, but also more more of a sense of shared community. Because there were so few books like The Hobbit, for example, you could pretty much assume that anyone who was in a circle who was interested in books like The Hobbit would have read The Hobbit and had probably also read The Camp and Lynn Carter, Fritz Lieber, and Moorcock. With such a small pool, there was much more of a, a common canon, a geek canon, if you will, that everyone kind of shared in common with each other. Speak with plants, not to be confused with speak with animals, and one level higher. This spell allows the cleric to speak with all forms of plant life, understanding Understanding what they say in reply. Plants so spoken to will obey commands of the cleric, such as parts to allow a passage and so on. This spell does not give the cleric the power to command trees as ants do, specifically allow trees to actually like uproot themselves and move around in a more meaningful fashion. So you can command the plants to kind of sway back and forth, but it sounds like they have to remain rooted in place based on that guideline. Create water. By means of this spell, the cleric can create a supply of drinkable water sufficient for a party of a dozen men and horses for one day. The quantity doubles for every level above the eight the cleric has attained. So you'll notice they're still giving you food.
food. We'll come to that at the fifth level spell. But you have to get almost to the top of the cleric spells in this in this edition before they take away the resource of water and allow you to just cast a spell and stop worrying about it. Fifth level. And again, much like the sixth level spells for magic users were the top end, what we think of as ninth level spells today, these fifth level spells for the clerics were the top end tier. These were the most powerful magical abilities that clerics would get in 1974. Dispel Evil. Similar to Dispel Magic, this allows a cleric to dispel any evil sending or spell within a 3 inch radius. It functions immediately and has a duration of one turn. And we talked about earlier about like the detect evil spell and the fact that e evil isn't really defined in this edition. OD&D only had law and chaos and neutrality between them. There wasn't a good evil alignment axis in this edition. This idea of dispel evil and what does it mean for something to come from evil is really interesting. The key thing to note here, I believe, yes, yeah, so the cleric does not have have a dispel magic spell. So in that context, the intention of this spell becomes a lot clearer, which is that dispel evil basically says you can dispel magic, but only if it's coming from evil people, because you are a bastion of goodness and light, is basically the idea here for the cleric. We talked about the fact that underlined cleric spells can be reversed for evil clerics. So the converse is also true. If you are an evil cleric, you can dispel good. And so you also get to spell magic, but only in the context of spells that are coming from good people. Now, in this case, you can also see here as we look at this, this is something we kind of, we hadn't touched on this yet, but if you look at this, it says, note that underlying clerical spells are reversed by evil clerics, which is weird because there are no evil clerics in OD&D because the alignment system is law and chaos and clerics are required to choose one of those two. Interestingly enough, though, as well, is that in OD&D, clerics don't pick whether they are law or chaos. Oh, I was about to, they do pick that, but they don't actually suffer any negative benefits from changing sides until they become a patriarch. So there's a really complicated thing going on there as well. Harlequin mentions that the cure spells are reversible into inflict spells, but the cure spells take a full turn to cast. So when do you cast inflict spells or do they get cast at different cast time? The exact nature of what reversing a spell means isn't spelled out, which is also confusing. This would be an argument and probably why the cure spells became cast on combat turns or rounds rather than full turns. By inference of it would be most useful if you were an evil cleric to be able to cast those inflict spells in a reasonable time frame for combat purposes. But you could certainly also argue that evil clerics would use inflict spells to wreak havoc upon captives, for example. So... Fifth level, back to fifth level. We just did Dispel Evil, and now we're looking at Raise Dead. The cleric simply points his finger, utters the incantation, and the dead person is raised. This spell works with men, elves, and dwarves only. For each level the cleric has possessed beyond the eighth, the time limit for resurrection extends another four days. Thus, an eighth level cleric can raise a body dead up to four days, a ninth level cleric can raise a body dead up to eight days, and so on. Naturally, if the character's constitution was weak, the spell will not bring him back to life. In any event, raised characters must spend two game weeks to time recuperating from the ordeal. One thing to really note about Raise Dead here is how much this was a top tier ability and in many ways Raise Dead kind of broke some of the fundamental paradigms of how people felt the game worked back then. Death was a final frontier when your character died you had to roll up a new one. You went on expeditions whether into the dungeon or the wilderness and one of the things you were gambling was your survival against the treasure and the power that you could gain. If you have a spell that can bring you back from the dead suddenly you are gambling with house money. You are not risking your life to go forth and get treasure. And so you can see some of the limitations that are placed on the spell in terms of the timeline. You have to have the body in order to raise them and so forth. Uncertainty is also part of this. Unless you have the highest level of constitution, you have to make a percentile dice check against what would later become system shock rolls to see if the raised dead succeeded. And if it didn't, you didn't come back from the dead. In this era of dedicated play, where a lot of people just play with straight up script immunity, where no one is really allowed to die, and death isn't really something that's on the line as stakes ever, because the expectation is that PCs don't die, and if it does, something horribly wrong has happened. It's hard to kind of put yourself back in the mindset where raised dead is kind of the exception to the rule. You aren't really expected to have it until you are the most powerful characters imaginable. And for most people, death is the end, and death is a real risk that you that you run every time you sit down at the table. Even over Lord mentions that Raised Dead does not have any diamond material component, no gold piece cost to the spell. That's absolutely true. There's no, there's actually no physical components for spell casting or any other components for spell casting in OD&D. Those are all later additions. Uh, History Prop also mentions the recovery time after being raised. You have to get back to their body quickly, and even if you do raise them back up, you can't just immediately hop back into adventuring. If someone dies, you are still done with that expedition. You need to get them out of the dungeon, get a Raised Dead spell on them, and then they're done for a couple of weeks. Which, depending on how time was being 
handled might mean that the player actually couldn't play that character in the real world for weeks and would have to roll up a new character anyways and, and so on. and this is one of the reasons why people would have multiple characters Phoenix 4 mentions you got to have a binder full of characters, no telling how fast you'll go through them. That is absolutely true. When I was running OD&D for Phoenix 4, among others, players would frequently be, would be like, okay, well, we're on a bit of a downtime. I'm going to roll up my next character and just have that socked away for when the inevitable happens to me. This is actually a really good insurance policy because by Murphy's Law, once you had rolled up your replacement character, your current character would survive forever. Commune, a spell which puts the cleric in touch with the powers above and asks for help in the form of answers to three questions. Communing is allowed but once each week, uh, maximum, referee's option is to making it less frequent. Veracity and knowledge should be near total. Once per year, a special communing should be allowed wherein the cleric can ask double the number of questions. So the commune spell has to be specifically viewed in the context of the magic user's contact other planes. And the big difference here is, is that the cleric's commune spell has no risk of insanity and really in this edition no risk that the answers will be incorrect either but you have to balance that in some way and so you can see they basically say you can't do it that often Harlequin mentions that they love the idea that the magic users are stealing wisdom that is freely bestowed on clerics. That is a really interesting interpretation. I've always thought of it as being more that the, 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 the higher powers that the wizards are reaching out to are a little bit more Lovecraftian than the ones that the clerics are reaching out to. But I do like that idea that they're all reaching out to the same gods. It's just clerics actually have a decent relationship with them. Insect Plague, we have another Ten Commandments inspired cleric spell. By means of this spell, the cleric calls to him a vast cloud of insects and sends them where he will within the spell range. They will obscure vision and drive creatures with less than three hit dice off in route. Again, you can see the combat application. The dimensions of this insect plague are 36 square inches. They last for one game day. They have a range of 48 inches. And note, this spell is effective only above ground. Create food. A spell with which the cleric creates sustenance sufficient for a party of a dozen for one game day. The quantity doubles for every level above eight that the cleric has obtained. Note, there are anti-clerics listed below who have similar powers to clerics. Those clerical spells underlined on the table for clerical spells have a reverse effect, all others functioning as noted. The chief exception is the raise dead spell, which becomes... I'd actually forgotten that raise dead alone has an explanation of what the reversed spell does. So we'll get to that in just one sec. So create food, same thing about create water. You can see how much, like, create food is like one of the most powerful things you can ever do in the game because it completely removes the expedition resource gain from play once you can access that spell. The reversed version of Ray's Dead is Finger of Death. Instead of raising the dead, this spell creates a death ray which will kill any creature unless a saving throw is made when applicable. Range 12 inches. A cleric type may use this spell in a life or death situation, but misuse will immediately turn them into an anti-cleric. So now we have yet another term. We have good clerics and evil clerics and now also anti-clerics, which appear to be the same thing as evil clerics, which are probably the same thing as chaos clerics. And then they list anti-clerics, and what they're doing here is they are listing the level names for evil clerics. And what I love about that is this, is this is literally just the names of clerics, but with the word evil in front of it, with the exception of the patriarch becoming an evil high priest instead. All right, we have finished uh, finished the spells, and now we are looking at, this is in fact the, the last rules page in the Men and Magic book here, and we are looking at magic research. Both magic users and clerics may attempt to expand on the spells listed as applicable by class. This is a matter of time and investment. The level of the magic required to operate the spell, determination by referee, dictates the initial investment. Investment for first level is 2,000 gold pieces, second level is 4,000 gold pieces, third level, etc, etc. The time required is one week per spell level. For every amount equal to the basic investment spent, there is a 20 percent chance of success. Cumulative. An investment of 10,000 gold pieces in order to develop a new first level spell, for example, has a 100 percent chance of success after one game week. The level of the spell researched must be consistent with the level of the magic user or cleric involved, i.e. the character must be able to use spells equal to or above the level of the one he desires to create. Once a new spell is created, the researcher may include it in the list appropriate to its level. He may inform others of it, thus enabling them to utilize it, or he may keep it to himself. Don't have a lot to say about that except I think again like when the rule books are so short when you give half a page to something there's a real emphasis to that being a uh, essential component of play and I think it also serves as, as a reminder too that some of the spells that we're seeing in this book didn't just come from Arneson and Gygax they came from Arneson's game table and Gygax's game table they came out of actual play book of spells characters who employ spells are assumed to acquire books containing the spells they can use one book for each level if a duplicate set of such books is desired the cost will be the same as the initial 
initial investment for research is listed above, i.e. 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, etc. Loss of these books will require a replacement at the above expense. And then we wrap things up with a picture of a hobgoblin. There's one last page inside the first printing of the book here, and it is in fact a catalog for TSR at the time. This is also available from Tactical Studies Rules. Uh, Cavaliers and Roundheads, English Civil War miniature rules. Tricolor, a Napoleonic miniature rules that was coming soon. Uh, you can order a set of multi-sided dice. We were talking about this last stream about how new these polyhedral dice were. TSR was in the business of reselling the ones. They were not yet in the business of manufacturing them or sourcing them directly, but they would order them from the Californian company that was importing them from, I believe, Japan, and then resell them themselves with, of course, markups each step along that path. They also were selling uh, miniature figures. As you can see, it's a complete line of Scrooby miniatures, including Fantasy and Engage. And so what they're saying there is you can order from us as basically a distributor of those. And you can combine that with your other orders and we will source those for you. Many new rule booklets to be released at approximately three month intervals. They are promising a space war game rules. These are, none of these are role playing rules, obviously, um, although some of them would kind of be adapted towards that end. But the space war game rules was an interesting kind of precursor to Traveler. They weren't role playing rules, but you did control a kind of like Firefly type ship in space that would journey out and kind of explore planets and stuff. I haven't actually had a chance to play it, but I'm really interested about it. Uh, Napoleonic naval campaign rules, naval orders of battle for the great age of sail, the Wild West campaign campaign rules would become Boot Hill, which was marketed as another early role-playing game. The first edition of Boot Hill is actually a really interesting one to look at as well, because it's kind of marketed as a D&D type game, but it's also really clear that they hadn't quite figured out what made D&D unique, what a role-playing game was. And so that first edition of Boot Hill has some very interesting structures that we would not recognize today as being a role-playing game, but you can kind of see how they were trying to figure this thing out. We also have the Ancient Rules. I don't know if anything became of that. Uh, they say we pay postage on all booklets and dice, add 5% for postage on miniature figure orders. Wisconsin residents must add 4% sales tax. And then they give an address, uh, the same address where they said you could write for questions earlier in the book. Prince and Dungeons and Dragons. So there's this print set where they diff all this wonderful, amazing art, like this piece here, or that Hobgoblin, can be purchased as prints. I've actually never seen any copies of these prints in the wild or what they may have looked like. They were printed 8.5 by 11 inches, so they would have been larger than the size of these books. These, these books for OD&D were actually 6 by 9ers. And so it would have been a large-scale reproduction of this art. You can see the, the cost there, and of course they're available from the same place as everything else from Tactical Studies Rules at the time. And then, of course, we also have well the final page of art there hanging out followed by our back cover and that will in fact wrap up min and magic volume one of the three booklets that were found in the original white box edition of D, &D. good gaming this is justin alexander and i hope to see you at the table <laughs>